Legal questions to the Minister of Justice. We must now move on to questions to the Minister for Social Development, and I call Mr. Chris Hazard. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I understand that the member has clarified that his question relates to housing and regeneration pilot schemes. In that respect, my department has introduced the following pilot schemes since May 2011. The boiler replacement scheme, which is finished. The affordable warmth phases one and two, phase one finished, phase two ongoing. Pay as you go pilot, which is finished. The empty homes pilot finished. The first home, first by Northern Ireland scheme, which is finished. Affordable home loans fund ongoing. Six building successful communities pilots ongoing. Resurgium social enterprise pilot project ongoing. Tyrone Donegal partnership virtual incubation and software training academy vista ongoing development trust northern ireland community asset transfer ongoing and two signature projects through the ofm dfm delivering social change program namely nurture units and social enterprise incubation units and both of those are ongoing Thank you. Mr Hazard for a supplementary. And can I thank the Minister for his answer. Can I ask the Minister to outline how many of these schemes have been introduced in his own North Belfast constituency and indeed in the wider list of total schemes, if you could go back to me perhaps on the geographic location of each scheme and where they were introduced. Gormilgut. Well, I think if, if the member had actually listened to the um, list that I read out, uh, the fulsome list, he would be aware, of course, that the boiler replacement scheme operated right across the province. Affordable warm phases one and two is being taken uh, forward in a number of areas. Pay-as-you-go pilot was uh, most certainly not North Belfast. The empty homes uh, was spread across several constituencies. First by uh, Northern Ireland scheme was province-wide. Affordable home loans fund, again, um, widespread, um, so that none of them uh, was restricted to one constituency, and some, most of them, in fact, were province-wide. Mr. David Hildridge. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Uh, Minister, how much uh, funding was allocated to the Affordable Homes Loan Scheme, and how many homes will it uh, provide for? Um, my, my department received £19 million of loan funding from the Treasury over the years 2012, 13 and 13, 14, under the Get Britain Building banner, um, which has been allocated, uh, that amount of money has been allocated to three housing associations. That will provide interest-free loans to the housing associations to develop new affordable housing throughout Northern Ireland between now and 2019, 20. Outline proposals from the associations indicate that funding at this level could provide up to 620 new homes, including bringing up to 150 empty homes back into use as affordable homes. These homes will be targeted at first-time buyers and those returning to the market, giving them an all-important step onto the housing ladder and helping to promote economic growth, assisting the construction industry to create and maintain jobs during a period when that uh, sector is under pressure. My department is currently working with housing associations to ensure plans are in place that would allow them to commence 100 new homes in the financial year 2013-14. Thank you. And I call Mr. Colin Eastwood. Thank you. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, can I ask the Minister how many of these schemes have been subject either to a full EQIA or have been screened for EQIA? Well, these schemes are pilot schemes. And I think when you get to issues such as uh, energy efficiency um, and the other sorts of issues that we're dealing there with around uh, bringing homes back into use, those are issues that affect every part of Northern Ireland. So rather than getting bogged down in the technicalities of uh, EQIAs, what I'm more interested in is actually addressing the real needs of people, uh, because the tragedy is that during the years when his party had charge of this department, these issues were ignored. We move on. I call Mr. Tom Elliott. Question number two, Principal Deputy Speaker. Again, thank the member for, for his question. In May 2013, 
The Chairman of the Housing Executive advised me that an internal investigation had indicated an estimated £18 million had been overpaid to planned maintenance contractors. In June 2013, the Board of the Housing Executive commissioned an external independent review into how the organisation had been dealing with planned maintenance contracts over the last five years. This was following evidence of substantial overcharging and advised that until this issue was satisfactorily resolved, the four planned maintenance contractors would not receive any new contracts from the Housing Executive. The Housing Executive Board has now asked for these three things to be in place before moving forward to make appointments. And the three things are, first, an agreement to repay any overpayments found to have been made, an agreement on what additional sample inspections are to be done, and an agreement on how the sample inspection results will be applied to allow a robust estimate of the financial position to be reached. The first agreement is in place. The Housing Executive is waiting for a response from the contractors on the proposals made regarding points two and three. If those agreements are reached over the next two weeks, the Housing Executive's Board will be in a position to appoint contractors to the framework at its November meeting. It comes to Tom Elliott for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister uh, tell us or inform the House uh, how much those overpayments have come to that have been paid back? Um, I would ask the member to show a, a little patience in that regard because um, there is a figure in the report that has been produced by um, this firm uh, of consultants, Campbell to Kell. Um, that report was commissioned, as I have said, by the Housing Executive, and therefore uh, the figures will be known to the uh, Chair of the Housing Executive and to the Board. The information will be given then to the Social Development uh, Committee on Thursday when they receive copies of that. And I think it would be uh, probably premature for me to quote the figure today because that information will be disclosed. There is an embargo on those reports until Thursday, and therefore I would prefer not to, to, to breach that. But I think it is true to say, and there can be no doubt about it, um, it is not a good report. It doesn't make good reading. It's a good report in itself, but it's about a very dire subject. It does not make good reading. And there is a very uh, substantial, very substantial overpayment figure mentioned in that. Thank you. And I call Mr Ian McRae. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister explain to the House how any contractors who are alleged by the Housing Executive to have received over overpayments have been successful in securing new contracts with the Housing Executive? Um, again, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, thank the member for, for the question. There is a, a, a balancing exercise here to be carried out by the Executive in terms of making sure that uh, they do all that they can to protect the public purse, uh, whilst at the same time ensuring uh, the good, uh, good service to tenants. And, uh, there, there is a difficulty there. But in, in June, the Housing Executive Board determined that the planned maintenance contractors would not be awarded any new contracts until the overpayments issue had been resolved. Since that time, the Housing Executive has held a series of meetings with the contractors. And one uh, outcome of the meetings is that the contractors have agreed, that's important, to repay any overpayments. The next step now is to quantify the agreed amount. Now, as a result of the progress that has been made, the housing executive uh, has made progress with the contractors. They have been able to let the new double glazing contracts. However, the housing executive board must receive further assurances from the officers and the contractors before new plan maintenance contracts are awarded. And as I indicated, I would be hoped that this will be dealt with, certainly will be discussed at the Housing Executives Board uh, meeting later this month, the end of November. Thank you. And I call Ms Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, does he continue to stand over his claim of overpayment to the tune of £18 million? And uh, if he does, does he acknowledge uh, the widespread concern and hardship it has uh, meant to uh, small firms who now face cash flow problems from the bank on the basis of his allegations? Um, the the figure that was quoted was the figure provided by the Chair of the Housing Executive, and I am sure the Member is aware of that fact. 
The member is also a member of the Social Development Committee, and I would assume will have already received her copy of the uh, Campbell to Kell report uh, prior to the meeting on Thursday. Um, if she hasn't, she will be receiving it in the next uh, day or so, uh, because there will be an opportunity, I'm sure, for members to look at it before the meeting. It will be embargoed until Thursday. Uh, and on Thursday, the figure, as currently estimated by Campbell to Kell, um, will be disclosed. Uh, I have already said, and the member will be aware, I have made the point already to answer to a previous question, that it does not make good reading as a report. It does identify, as I indicated at the time, very, very serious shortcomings within the housing executive uh, over a sustained period, um, reaching back more than a decade um, to the period, because it, it shows, I think, that the introduction of the Egan contracts back in 2001, there was a shortcoming there in terms of how they were managed, serious shortcoming, that led to um, the, the sort of situation we saw there. And um, the, the, figure, the figure is currently estimated by Campbell to Kell will be disclosed on Thursday. As I have said already, it does not make good reading, because it shows quite clearly uh, that a very substantial amount of overpayment was made. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, it wouldn't matter whether it was 5, 10, 15 or 20. Whatever it is, it's far too much. Okay, and I call Mr Robin Swan. Question number three, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Again, I thank the member for, for the question. My, my department currently provides funding to the housing side to deliver a shared community programme. The objectives of this programme are to reduce uh, housing segregation, develop, support and sustain current shared communities and increase community cohesion, bridging and participation. 30 existing housing executive estates with some 60,000 residents are supported through this programme and a further 20 shared communities are being developed and supported. For new social housing developments, the housing executive identifies developments which are deemed suitable for shared designation and then works with the relevant housing association to promote and develop the scheme, subject to residents' agreement as shared housing. To date, this approach has delivered 11 shared new build schemes. My department has also been tasked with taking forward proposals to create 10 new shared neighbourhood developments, as set out by OFM-DFM in the Together Building United Communities document. In taking this work forward, I have asked my officials, with examining the current Shared Communities programme, to identify what lessons can be learned from the good work done to date to develop greater levels of sharing within social housing, and we are considering the feasibility of up to 17 potential shared sites. We will also examine whether there is scope and, indeed, a need to encourage similar activity within private housing development. I will call Robin Swan for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal. Let's thank the Minister. The Together Building a United Community document has raised more questions than answers. Really, can the Minister explain whether a budget has now been decided, whether the locations have been picked or even suggested in pilots, and the dates chosen for when this work will commence? Um, I think uh, I tried to make clear, perhaps it wasn't clear enough in regard to that, that this is very much still a work in progress. We're looking at 17 possible sites, um, but it will take some time to work through um, the exact details of those. And of course, this is not a question about money, because whether you build houses for what in effect turns out to be a segregated community, or whether you build the same number of houses and you try to push that as a shared uh, community. Um, the cost of house building isn't going to be very much different. So it's not a cost issue, it's an attitude issue, it's about how you approach it, and essentially at the core of this, it is about getting the, the uh, consent, the agreement, the, the, the commitment of the people who want to live in that shared community. I call Ms Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, can I ask the Minister, is preferential status given at all um, to applicants who specifically want to live in a shared, a shared housing area? Um, all social housing in Northern Ireland um, is allocated on the basis of need. Uh, that is the legal position, that is how it is, and this ensures that the allocation of housing is compliant with Northern Ireland's equality legislation. We cannot socially engineer mixed housing. 
It's simply impossible to do that. And that's why I've tasked the housing executive with working with the housing associations and local communities to support and encourage them to see the benefits of shared housing. Uh, uh, could I th uh, thank you, um, uh, uh, Deputy Speaker, um, and could I thank the Minister for his answers. In relation to the implementation of what I think is a very bold and good uh, approach in terms of integrated housing, how will the Minister guarantee that, in fact, he gets that mix of integrated uh, residents in a particular area? How is that going to be achieved, particularly given the criteria of need that the Minister has just outlined? Um, and the Member will be aware that, as I said earlier, there are already um, 10 or so schemes, uh, sorry, to date 11 shared new schemes. Um, it's purely dependent on how you advertise the, the, the location. So the example being the, the case in Antrim, uh, where there was a widespread call across the province where people did they want to come and live in what would be a shared community. And people came from different areas to that. And that was their choice. Um, so that's really as far as you can go. You can encourage, but you cannot coerce. And that, that is the, the line that needs to be drawn and needs to be, needs to be recognised. We cannot give extra points. We cannot do anything in that regard because the member would be, uh, I'm sure, opposed to that uh, sort of uh, situation where you altered uh, the, the, the uh, allocation of houses, how it's done. Um, but the, the key thing here is to encourage people and to spread the net widely. Um, and in some cases, it has worked better than others. Um, but this is some, an area in which there are no guarantees. Thank you. And I call Mr Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number four, please. In terms of the Bloomfield Bungalow scheme specifically, I'm pleased to report that the stock transfer of these properties to Oakley Housing Association is progressing as planned, following the recent tenant ballot, which resulted in an overwhelming majority in favour of the transfer proposal. And that was 96.7% of respondents who voted. So it was a pretty overwhelming vote in the case of Bloomfield. Uh, it is not possible to determine separately what portion of the current loan debt balance relates specifically to the properties included in the Bloomfield transfer and other potential transfers. In the past, the housing executive raised loans on an annual basis. Loans were not raised for specific new build and improvement schemes. Given these circumstances, therefore, there is no plan as referred to in your question. The debt, if any, will remain with the housing executive. The arrangement regarding rent arrears for any property within the stock transfer programme is that all arrears due to the housing executive from the tenants at the date of transfer will remain with the housing executive. And I call Mr Agnew for his supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Could I ask then, um, in the, regarding the wider proposal then for, for potential stock transfer and, and, and for the house, when the housing executive potentially stops being the landlord for these properties, how the historic debt will be managed, what way, and is that being considered a, a factor in terms of any business case for such a proposal? Well, we're very much at the start of the process, in the early stages of the process, for the reconfiguring of uh, social housing uh, in Northern Ireland and for the, the role of the housing executive. Um, so therefore, uh, there is a series of work programmes being taken forward looking at different aspects and areas of work. Um, in the spring of next year, I would hope to have some idea of the th thinking that is emerging, but at this stage it would be premature of me to, to comment on that. Um, there are a lot of these issues that are complex will need to be looked at and I have no, uh, nothing really to add at this point in time. Uh, it will be a matter that will come forward in due course. Thank you. I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Thank you Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what are the benefits of transferring these housing executive properties to housing associations? I would also like to put on record our appreciation to the Minister for the time it has put into this project. It is long awaited, long overdue. And the senior <coughs> citizens very much deserve it. Yeah. Um, the, the transfer programme will bring forward much needed improvements.
to raise the standards of some of our poorest quality housing stock. Overall, the standard of social housing in Northern Ireland is better than really, I suppose, anywhere else in the United Kingdom. But we do have a significant number of properties that are still of a poor standard that require work, and these tend to be older properties um, as opposed to newer ones. The nature of the works to be carried out on any particular scheme will be dependent upon the outcome of a stock condition survey, which will be carried out on each scheme and what other maintenance works may have already been completed on the property. Improvements for the tenants could include, for example, replacement of windows, refurbishment of windows and bathrooms, upgrading of heating systems and insulation measures. And it will provide tenants in the end with high quality, decent, modern homes that are fit for purpose. And that should indeed be our desire. The sad thing is that for many years uh, some of these issues were overlooked, but we really are getting to grips with them now. I call Mr Leslie Cree. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I wonder would the Minister advise how the estimated value of the houses to be transferred compares to the estimated cost of the refurbishments proposed to be undertaken by the Housing Association? Um, th 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 there's no simple answer to that question because um, it will depend very much on the amount of work uh, to be done to each of the properties. Um, and that will vary from case to case. In some cases, the work will be more substantial than in others. And that's why when I listed some of the work there, um, I, I quoted the um, range of work that might be considered. But it will depend very much on each case. At the end of the day, the, the, the real advantage here is that the Housing Association will have access to private finance, will be able to bring in additional money, and therefore work will be done on far more properties than could possibly be done otherwise and therefore tenants will receive a benefit that otherwise might not have been achieved. Thank you. And I call Mr Sidney Anderson. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question 5. Um, I think we all recognise uh, the enjoyment we can have in our gardens, and the recent good summer made those of us lucky enough to have one uh, realise just that. However, the task of looking after them is not an easy one as it takes time, energy and money, something perhaps not always taken into account when a home with a garden is allocated to a tenant. The Housing Executive has advised me that they do not routinely provide assistance with garden maintenance for their tenants. This is in line with the Tenancy Agreement, which advises that the tenant is responsible for the care and upkeep of gardens and hedges. In relation to housing associations, they have advised that it states in the tenancy agreement that it is the responsibility for tenants to maintain their own gardens. And therefore, in general, family dwellings, housing associations do not provide any assistance with gardens nor have plans to do so. And I call Mr Sidney Anderson for a supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for that response. Uh, can I ask the Minister if there would be a role for, he mentions the Housing Association, would, would there be a role for housing associations to provide for their help and assistance uh, for residents in relation to this matter? Um, the member beside me was uh, chiding me there for being uh, somewhat misleading in that uh, I am not the person in our house who does the gardening. But having set that point aside, uh, the most housing associations, older tenants, live in sheltered accommodation where there are communal gardens and grassed areas rather than individual gardens. In sheltered accommodation, housing associations do maintain the grass and planted areas, the hedges, curbs, footpaths and car parks, and that is funded through the service charge. In addition, many tenants help maintain the gardens and many schemes have tenants groups who do fundraising, attract funding grants and provide more plants, etc. For the grounds. And it's true to say that uh, some uh, cases there are voluntary organisations. I've met some, and visited some actually in uh, North Down constituency where um, work is done by a community organisation to, to uh, assist older people who may not have access to uh, resources to pay for the gardening. Um, but there is an opportunity for, there for housing associations. And I have said already in recent days we want housing associations to be more creative, more innovative. It is about building communities rather than just building houses. And taking a particular regard for the elderly and vulnerable is part of that building of community. And I call Ms Joanne Dobson. 
Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Untidy gardens can cause problems for residents because of their impact on the overall appearance of the area. So, can I ask the Minister to explain what powers the Executive has um, to compel tenants to maintain their gardens to a minimum standard? It's an issue of unkept gardens which occurs in many different places. And should the member be aware of examples where it happens even in privately owned homes uh, where you may have a vulnerable homeowner who is not able to maintain a garden and is unable to do so. So um, the, the position very clearly is that the tenancy agreement makes clear that it is the responsibility of the tenant. However, um, in terms of putting uh, some or exerting some influence on the tenant uh, other than speaking to and encouraging. Um, I would be interested to hear of any suggestions from the member if she has any thoughts on how uh, that might be increased. But other than encouragement, I don't think that it's uh, particularly possible. I'm not sure uh, other than unless it gets to a situation where there is a, a health issue uh, that arises. But simply long grass may not fall quite into that category. Thank you. And I call Mr Chris Little. Question number six. Um, could I start off by saying that these are not housing regeneration areas, as the question assumes. Uh, they are, in fact, building successful communities pilots. The concept for the six building successful communities pilots is that a regeneration forum is to be established in each area, drawing membership from elected representatives, local communities and statutory and voluntary agencies, such as the housing executive, housing associations, local councils, the police service, health and education. These six forums, in consultation with local communities, will then develop an action plan for each pilot. My department is still in the process of identifying and appointing forum members. However, since the action plans will be specific and individual to each pilot area, there is nothing to prevent proposals for shared housing coming forward as a result of this process. The main aim of this pilot programme is to drive regeneration through concerted social, economic and physical interventions by a range of departments, agencies and community interests. And the communities themselves will be right there at the heart of the approach. I call Mr Little for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for his answer. Would the Minister agree that central to economic regeneration is the promotion of integration? And can I ask him how these forums will uh, ensure that integration is promoted rather than segregation is maintained? Um, of course, uh, and I've already answered in a, in a previous question, pointed out that um, through the um, Together Building uh, United Communities, we're, we're uh, taking forward a number of initiatives in that regard. But I would suggest to you that the areas in which those are more likely to succeed are probably not some of our most difficult inner city communities where there are significant area levels of deprivation and so on. Um, six pilot areas have been selected and we are taking that work forward. There are real challenges in there and I think that the, um, we should not in any way seek to be prescriptive or coercive towards those local forums, that they should be given the freedom, the flexibility to see what can be done to address all of those issues. Um, that I mentioned they are physical, social um, and environmental. They, they are challenging communities, areas that, having benefited over a number of years from neighbourhood renewal uh, or being areas at risk, but nearly all, I think, near, uh, neighbourhood renewal areas, still have serious problems that have not been resolved. And the challenge, I think, the focus has to be primarily and initially on, on, on addressing those issues. Peter Weir for a very quick supplement. <coughs> I'll be very quick, Mr. Deputy uh, Speaker. Can I ask the Minister then what support there is for a housing-led approach to regeneration? I suppose to answer that question, I would make two points. The first is that driving regeneration using housing is a key theme in the new housing strategy. And when that was brought forward for consultation, there was widespread uh, support for that approach. And subsequently, having announced uh, pilot areas for building successful communities. I received much positive feedback from those communities. So I think 
Uh, it's, it's a key theme in the housing strategy and has received widespread support and endorsement. Thank you. And, uh, that brings an end to the period for oral questions. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call Ms Rosaline McCorley. Uh, can I ask the Minister if he can explain the delay in setting up a task force to uh, address the issue of home repossessions, which have increased by 20 per cent this year, according to Housing Rights Surveys? Um, the issue of uh, supporting people whose homes are in danger of being repossessed um, is one that has been very much in our mind, has been raised in this chamber on, on a number of occasions. Um, I believe that the support that we are giving at the moment through um, the Housing Rights Service and the additional support, uh, financial support that was given there to them to enable them to support people in those positions um, has been particularly important. There is a clear difference between folk who effectively bury their heads in the sand and hope that a terrible situation will go away and those who face up to it and take legal advice and get uh, practical advice from the Housing Rights Service. Um, the, the clear difference there are people arriving in the court and about to lose their house and then maybe an intervention at the last minute. The key thing is to get in touch with the Housing Rights Service at a very early stage. Um, we keep the situation constantly um, under review as to um, what additional measures might need to be taken. And that's something that certainly uh, we haven't uh, forgotten about or neglected in any way. But I would encourage people primarily to approach it through that particular method of the, using the, the services of the Housing Rights Service. Ms. Rosalind McCarley for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, can I ask the Minister what alternatives uh, from other jurisdictions has he examined in order to seek a remedy to this issue? There are a number of options that were mentioned in the past where financial interventions were talked about. Um, but when you look at the scope of the problem and the extent of the, the, the financial difficulty of the individual and scale that up, um, it would be possible to help, in practical terms, a very small number of people, whereas the, the problem, as the member well knows, is, is, uh, affects several hundred, number of hundreds of people each year. Um, and therefore, whilst we have looked at other options elsewhere, the, the, the primary response has to be the one that we're adopting at the moment, but as I say, it is something we do keep under review. Thank you, and I call Mr. Stuart Dixon. Thank you, um, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, given the evidence to the DSD inquiry on Thursday past, uh, with regards to a letter of the 24th of May 2012 to the chair of the committee, did you mislead the committee? Um, there is a process being taken forward by the committee at the moment. Um, there were a number of submissions made uh, last Thursday. There will be further submissions made this Thursday. Um, I am due, uh, due to come in, um, to uh, the committee later on in the month of uh, December. I think it is the 12th of December. And at that point, I will, in fact, be uh, giving a submission to the committee. I think it would be wrong and premature to address it until I had the courtesy of giving that to the committee. Principal Deputy Speaker, it's a very simple question to the Minister. Did he mislead the committee? I think we should note he hasn't answered the question. Why, Minister, did you give an instruction uh, to a civil servant to change the content of that letter? Um, I don't know if the member has difficulty understanding plain English, but uh, I simply said there, uh, in response to the first point, that I would uh, make the uh, information available to the committee on the 12th of December when I go to the committee, and I intend, in response to your second question, to give the answer to that in due course as well. Um, it's a very simple answer. It will be given on the 12th of December, and I just ask the member to have a little bit of patience. I call Mr Sidney Anderson. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, in light of comments by the new energy regulator today and that high energy costs are, are here to stay, can I ask the Minister, can he assure me that all is being done uh, in his power to assist those who are most in need to heat their homes? Um, again, thank the member for, for the question. The fact is that in Northern Ireland, according to the House Conditions Survey, um, the fuel poverty affects 42 per cent 
That is about 295,000 households in Northern Ireland. Um, and as the member is aware, um, fuel poverty arises really from income level, fuel cost and energy efficiency. Um, we have had the statement uh, from the regulator uh, today in regard to the cost of energy in Northern Ireland and the fact that it is set to remain high into the foreseeable future. We can do something, I suppose, about income to a limited extent. My department uh, does run a very extensive um, benefit uptake programme, and that benefit uptake programme uh, will, uh, again this year as it has done in previous years, uh, make a substantial difference to quite a number of vulnerable people who are on low incomes. But um, the other main area of work that we have is in terms of energy efficiency of homes. We have the Warm Homes Scheme, uh, the Boiler Replacement Scheme, and those really do make a difference. Um, the Affordable Warmth Pilot, again, that we are uh, taking forward. And then also it is important to remember that those aged 60 and over are entitled to a winter fuel payment. So the um, work that we are doing in terms of delivering um, some financial support through benefit uptake and through the winter fuel payment and the energy efficiency are the two principal areas that we can work on. And I hope that um, we will see uh, a reduction in fuel poverty as we see our homes in Northern Ireland made more energy efficient. Mr Anderson, for a supplementary. Uh, thank you. Um, can I thank the Minister for that response? The, the Minister will know that I recently raised the energy efficiency of homes with him, especially those that are single wall dwellings. Can he provide me with an assurance that these types of dwellings will be made a priority in any forward work programme? Um, I have certainly been looking at this issue for some time now, um, since I became aware that there were uh, around 5,000 housing executive properties across Northern Ireland that were of no fines construction, um, most of them constructed from a single uh, skin of concrete uh, and no cavity. Um, there is some work being taken forward at the moment. We have a, a housing side of a set up a working group to progress a strategic approach to look at the thermal performance of all housing executive no fine stock. And I recently visited Spring Farm in Antrim, where uh, I met the consortium of the Technology Strategy Board to view the no fines houses in that estate and discuss the methods that could be used in providing external insulation to the seven properties that are there in the pilot. And the lessons that we've learned over the coming year through that pilot will not just benefit people in Northern Ireland, but people throughout the United Kingdom, because the Technology Strategy Board um, and the experts that have been brought across from GB to look at this um, are, are really operating a pilot for the whole of the United Kingdom. I might also add that um, early next month I'm proposing to uh, visit the Leonardo Project in Germany to see for myself a successful retrofit scheme uh, that was carried out there. I um, did have the opportunity some months ago of seeing retrofit carried out in Liverpool. The, the German scheme is somewhat different. There are lessons to be learned, but this is something that I have made a priority. I'm sure, like the member, I'm aware of many homes in my own constituency uh, that suffer from this particular problem. Thank you. And I call Mr David Hildreth. Thank you, Mr uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, do you have any concerns uh, that delays to the Welfare Reform Bill will place uh, the, his department's ability to administer and provide benefits to the most vulnerable at risk? The member makes a very important point here, and one that has been largely overlooked in general comment and in particular in the media. Because when we talk about welfare reform and delays, we tend to think in terms of the recent visit by Mike Penning and the point he made in terms of financial penalties that would impact on the Northern Ireland block grant. Uh, but there is more to it than that because potentially it can also have uh, an impact on the viability of a number of jobs that we have in Northern Ireland providing services to the rest of the United Kingdom um, in, in uh, the delivery of welfare. There is also this point that has been made there um, that, as regards this, I am really concerned, I have to say, that delays to the Welfare Bill are already resulting in operational difficulties due to the need to put in place clerical workarounds as the two benefit systems begin to diverge. So there are practical difficulties as well, and that is putting at risk the Social Security Agency's ability to administer and provide benefits, and the agency is already incurring additional costs. At the moment, modest, but they will very quickly rack up. 
I have also written to ministerial colleagues advising them of the operational impact resulting from the introduction in GB of the new mandatory reconsideration process, which went live in GB on 20 October. This meant that certain benefit decision notifications issued to claimants in Northern Ireland contain incorrect information on how to dispute their decision. So in order to ensure that they get the correct information, an insert has had to be included with the notifications issued to Northern Ireland claimants, and the agency has incurred additional costs of some £90,000 at this juncture over that single point. So it is important not just for the penalty issue to be kept in mind, and that is a hugely important one, as, uh, as uh, the um, DWP minister pointed out, um, but there are also these practical difficulties that are detrimental to claimants in Northern Ireland. Thank you. I call Mr Hildreds for a supplementary. Thank you, and thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, but going back to the divergence, are we reliant on GBIT systems uh, to deliver benefits here in Northern Ireland? I must apologise to the member. I, I got slightly distracted there uh, in one sense. It's a point that should have made there. Absolutely. We are totally dependent in Northern Ireland on the, the IT system throughout the rest of the United Kingdom. There is no possibility of Northern Ireland going it alone and devising its own IT system for um, welfare payments. Um, it would be uh, totally impossible. The cost would be astronomical, and it would be simply uh, totally destructive to the Northern Ireland Block Grant in terms of the cost of it. How we could do it, I just could not imagine, and anybody who thinks we could would be very much mistaken. It is a system that spreads right across the UK, and we are part of it. I call Mr John Ballot. Uh, Mr. Principal, uh, Deputy uh, Speaker, uh, the term eviction repossession is a very emotive term, reminiscent of Ireland a couple of hundred years ago. But unfortunately, between June and September, the number of people who have had their homes repossessed has increased by 20% over the same period last year. Will the Minister set up a task force to mitigate against the worst aspects? of something that I thought we had left behind hundreds of years ago. I am um, not sure what the procedure is in the Assembly for being asked the same question that you have already dealt with. Uh, I was thought if someone had already asked a question, the next person who had thought of asking it would ask a different question. But uh, the question was already asked there by uh, Ms McCourty earlier on, and I would refer the member to the answer which I gave to her. No apology whatsoever to the Minister for asking a question, which is very close. I'm not sure if the Minister has ever been at an eviction. It's not nice, but here's my supplementary. And the supplementary is the Housing Strategy Action Plan for 2012-2017 commits you, Minister, to creating a working group to mitigate against the effects of repossession on individuals and families. Will you now implement it, please? As I indicated, or at least I hope I indicated previously, it is an issue that we are constantly reviewing, constantly working on. And, uh, I said earlier there are welcoming, I would welcome at any time ideas from any individuals as to how uh, we might do things more differently, how we might do them better. Uh, if the member has any proposals that he wants to bring forward, I will be more than happy to receive them and to listen to them. I call Ms. Michelle Michael Bean. Mr. Deputy Speaker, could the Minister advise whether the bid for public realm funding for Newton Arts has been successful? Um, I'm pleased to uh, inform the member that uh, yes, the answer is that there will be an announcement very shortly. The public realm scheme in uh, Newton Arts, which was delayed in the past for various reasons, has now uh, been uh, brought forward. It is an extensive scheme, £5.5 million, pounds, will bring considerable benefit to Newton Ards, uh, and I am happy to confirm to him we have been making an announcement very shortly. Ms McLevin for a very quick supplementary. Thank you very much. And I obviously welcome the Minister's announcement and also the recent news that Cumber had also received £2.4 million, million funding for public realm. Can the Minister agree that improvements such as public realm can be an economic catalyst for small towns? There is very clear evidence that public realm work as part of a wider package of measures in a town centre can make a real difference to the town centre. Um, Revitalisation schemes uh, for the shops nearby uh, can often add to that. And generally, a public realm scheme emerges out of 
uh, a master plan for the town centre, which is a great opportunity for all those, whether it be the local authority, the local traders and business people, and uh, my own officials, to work together to see what is the best way forward for that particular town centre. Um, challenging time for town centres, very challenging indeed. Um, there were recent figures quoted uh, in terms of empty properties, and we need to boost the town centres to make them more attractive, greater footfall, more people in them, more people shopping, and therefore greater viability for, for the traders. Thank you, Minister. And that brings us to